Dick Russell, welcome back to the new school. Michael, thanks so much. Really good to be with you again. Dick, you are uh, the author of a three volume biography of the great archetypal psychologist James Hillman. Volume two just came out. It's called The Life and, the Life and Ideas of James, Hill James Hillman by Dick Russell. Um, and uh, 10 years ago, you and I talked about the first volume in 2013. And as you know, I have been uh, deeply involved in exploring uh, Hillman's ideas on the field of archetypal psychology for well over a decade and uh, have probably done at least 10 New School conversations, including conversations with Pat Berry, his second wife, and uh, with his son, Lawrence Hillman, and um, with uh, many others who have been interested in Hillman's work. Um, I am not given to uh, hyperbole, but I believe that your biography of Hillman will unquestionably be the definitive biography for at least a decade, probably many decades. Um, and I also feel that in writing it, you've done something for the field of archetypal psychology and archetypal studies. Because um, up till now, Hillman, who you and I and many others rank with Freud and Jung as among the you know, founding fathers uh, of, um, of, of depth psychology, of how, whatever language we want to put around that, archetypal and depth psychology, analytic, whatever. Um, up until now, one had uh, Hillman's books, one had the uh, 10 volume uh, standard edition of his papers, which I also have, um, and one had his various talks and so forth. But Hillman is so complex, and his thinking changed so much over time, or at least evolved over time, that without a biography of the scope and depth of the one that you have done, one can't really understand Hillman. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have changed the field. No. Thank you and I much. think, you know, I think that's just a reality. That isn't hyperbole. That's just a reality. And the family members I've talked to are very enthusiastic about the fairness with which you've done this. So I, I just want to start by thanking you mm -hmm. and saying I hope that anyone with an interest in archetypal psychology, especially Hillman, who wants to really uh, go deep into what this extraordinary field is about, your, your work is indispensable. I just want to start with a thanks. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. It was a labor of love. <laughs> so what that led me to, as you know, because we scheduled this conversation as a follow-up to the first one, and then I noticed, I just happened to notice that you were also, you had a new book out called The Real RFK Jr., Trials of a Truth Warrior. And so I had heard vaguely about the book, but I hadn't connected that you were the author of it. And in the community that I move in, the blue bubble of the progressive community, uh, RFK Jr., who used to be a hero of the progressive community, is now anathema. Absolutely mm -hmm. anathema. And so the question arose for me, Dick Russell has done this impeccable, astonishing uh, biography of Hillman, who's very popular in progressive circles. And at the same time, he's done uh, uh, what uh, appears on the surface to be a very uh, uh, positive biography of someone who in progressive circles is anathema. So then I was saying to myself, how is that possible? You know, what's going on there? So then I began to look, and it takes me a while to do this setup, but 
we have a little while. So then I began to look at your work and I thought, I want to, I want to do a biography of the biographer <laughs> as an introduction to the conversation about Hillman. And what I noticed when I looked at your website, uh, dickrussell.org, uh, and then I began to look at the whole set of books that you've done and your work, and you were kind enough also to send me a link to a film about you. Uh, what the through line to me seemed to me to be that you'd been interested in um, uh, revolutionary politics and progressive causes and in uh, the bad boys of uh, psychology and politics, two fields of great interest to me, uh, because you are an expert, among other things, first of all and foremost, on Hillman, this astonishing biography, but secondly, on the JFK assassination. And you've written a series of books with Jesse Ventura, who's an outlaw, if there ever was one, and then with RFK Jr. And of course, Hillman himself is an outlaw. Yeah. And so what came together for me uh, and your film uh, called Hitchhiking to the Edge of Sanity about uh, your adventure with a, a fellow young man from Kansas hitchhiking across the Sahara Desert, where you really were in danger of dying. Right. And what came together for me is that you pretty much been interested in um, uh, uh, the edges, hitchhiking to the edge of sanity, uh, of, of really looking at the edges of um, that which the consensus mainstream culture um, tends to be very hard on. So tell me, have I got it right? I think you do. Um, and it's, of course, uh, you know, we're talking a lifetime of of, uh, of a lot of adventures on, on my part and, and 15 different books. And, and, and they are very eclectic. I've been privileged in my life to, uh, I've got, you know, Hillman once said of himself that, and I'm not really trying to draw comparisons, but he once said that he, he um, he's someone who... Um, who who he he, he live he, he lives on the edges he writes about the edges he is um explores depth in a way of many different subjects all of the time uh with the ultimate uh depth being where the soul is trying to go and and um you know i've really been lucky i, I was a kansas kid you know I, I was born and raised in the midwest i was and my parents were not ultra conservative, but, you know, upper middle class Republicans. And and I went to the University of Kansas and I was a sports writer. That's where I started out. And and I was I was very successful, very young. Um, I, I was at KU at a good time and and uh, uh, got to write about track and field star Jim Ryan and a great basketball team, et cetera. And I went to work for Sports Illustrated magazine when I was 20 years old. I, I was an intern in New York and then I went to work full time. But something had happened during those years. I was also a, a child of the 60s, and I suddenly woke up, I guess, and, and you'd say in, in my, about my junior year of college that there was something going on besides sports. There was a civil rights movement, and, a, and that my, some of my friends were hippies, and the Vietnam War that was threatening to draft us all. And, and so I began to change, and um, I guess you'd say I was radicalized. I mean, um, I didn't last long at Sports Illustrated. I, I to my parents' dismay and my even my younger brother thinking I was crazy, I, I took off with a backpack and a portable typewriter after uh, only like seven full-time months at SI and and uh, traveled around the world for a year and a half. Didn't even know if I'd ever come back to this country. I was very disillusioned at that time. But discovered Jung along that path. Um, read his not only his, his Memories, Dreams, Reflections, but other works by him. And I don't know. It's kind of like I was led. I was, I, I've always, even when I was a kid, I believed in destiny that e each of us has an individual souls. I didn't call it a soul's code, which of course Hillman wrote about. And I later came to study, but um, you know, that, that there was a, a path that, that we were all on. And, and it also involved very much, not just the individual 
uh, and and getting to the depths of where we needed to go, but a sense of community and and um, I found that to be what I began to explore with with all my books. And we can continue my my biogra- biographical conversation if you want, but that was the beginning of it for me, uh, long before I met James Hillman. Thank you for that, because you've just encapsulated what I hope to ask you first, which is sort of the, you know, the story of your uh, your evolution from uh, a Kansas City upper middle class, uh, somewhat conservative childhood to uh, Sports Illustrated and then uh, the trip across the Sahara uh, and not even knowing if you'd come back to this country. Uh, and uh, then discovering Jung and uh, and onward from there. Let's go directly to the subject which is hardest for progressives, um, blue bubble people. I speak of the blue bubble, meaning, you know, the blue bubbles on, on the coast and in a few other parts of the country, um, which I inhabit. Uh, uh, but not as a true believer in the blue bubble, but rather like yourself in a way, as an observer uh, with progressive values, but uh, very interested in the edges myself. And one of the edges that interests me is RFK Jr. Uh, and um, he interests me particularly because his early history, when he was a darling of progressives, was so extraordinarily strong, you yeah. know, as an environmentalist, uh, as somebody who helped to uh, save the lagoon where the whales, uh, you know, uh, gathered and a critical, critical fight, which friends and colleagues of mine were very involved with. Um, and then uh, he began to venture into areas uh, where um, uh, where uh, the whole country or large parts of the country, but progressives particularly, just couldn't follow him. Uh, And uh, particularly uh, into um, the vaccine controversy, which buried him in terms of um, the mainstream. But but you, in addition to, in other words, you've been close to Jesse Ventura, not just, you've been close to Ventura, you've been close to him, and you've been close to RFK Jr. So, do you personally have a through line through those connections and friendships, not only as a, a biographer, but are you able to hold respect for the integrity of all three of those people as congruent with your own integrity? Yes, absolutely, I am. And I've I've known Robert Kennedy Jr., Bobby, as I, I call him, and friends call him, uh, for a long time. I met him in 1998 when I was actually doing a book on the very great whales that you mentioned and the fight to save that lagoon called Eye of the Whale. And he was an environmental lawyer for NRDC and and uh, also going to that lagoon to have these amazing encounters with friendly whales. I mean, they would come up to us uh, in our little boats on that lagoon and and mothers would introduce their babies i mean it was it was incredible like no like a, an unearthly experience i would say beyond this world and i fell in love with these animals as he did too and i ended up writing you know this another tome on on uh, their migration but then we also had in common that we we both loved to fish and and i had been very active my, my introduction to environmentalism happened in the 1980s uh, in a campaign I became involved in to, to save the Atlantic striped bass from oblivion uh, by getting stronger fishing regulations in place. So he'd been involved with that issue also on the Hudson River. We got to know each other quite well through the years and um, worked together. He wrote the introduction to, I wrote a book on climate change and the big moguls uh, most responsible for covering up what they their scientists knew 30 years ago about what was going on. Uh, called Horseman of the Apocalypse, later the paperback was Climate in Crisis. And he, Bobby wrote the introductions to both both those uh, editions. So I ended up, in a, I, and, I, and of course I followed his work in the public health arena, and, and uh, we never really talked about it all that much, but I had a lot of respect for him. I knew how courageous a guy he was. Um, I'm not going to pretend we weren't very close friends. We became closer and closer friends as years went by. 
And during the pandemic, when he was being really, I felt very unfairly vilified by the mainstream progressive media. And I thought, you know, I know a lot more about this guy and what he's been through in his life. Uh, the agony he went through after his his father and his uncle were both assassinated. Interestingly, I never, for many, many years, I had already written a book on the assassination of, of his uncle uh, called The Man Who Knew Too Much, which is one of the, I guess, seminal investigative works into that what, what really happened that day. So I knew a lot about it, but I never felt comfortable in raising that subject with Bobby because our relationship was really around environmental issues and I didn't know how I felt about it. Um, it's become clear over the years that, you know, as he studied it, that he too believes there was something definitely nefarious going on. There was a conspiracy involved in both his uncle's and his father's assassinations, which he's recently talked about. But anyway, the point being that uh, I just felt there needed to be something written about him that showed his journey, you know, what he'd, what he'd gone through to become, you know, the environmental hero he was and somebody who would take on the public health issues, uh, which were very, I felt his stance on that was misinterpreted. And still, I still feel that way, that he was, he's not an anti-vaxxer per se. He's not a conspiracy theorist. He's not crazy. And I felt that uh, that needed to be written about to some degree as well, but the book is mostly our real RFK Jr. is mostly about his 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 incredible success as an environmental lawyer and and working with people on all sides of the uh, you know Republicans and Democrats and independents to to uh, to make change <laughs> to save this help save this this country and this planet and uh, so I felt you know he's he I felt very fa- passionate about this and that's that's why I wrote the book I mean I'd known actually introduced Jesse Ventura and Bobby Kennedy back in 2006 on a fishing trip. Uh, and uh, that was in Mexico. And I had met Ventura by accident. He was the, he was the former governor of Minnesota, independent guy. Uh, we, he had a place in Mexico, not far from where my extended family has a, had a residence. And uh, so we met and I ended up doing a whole bunch of books with him, um, including his, his memoir, because I had a lot of respect for him. I mean, he's very bright. We weren't ideologically opposed on things. And uh, again, he was somebody I felt had a lot to say. And, and we had common interests in, in uh, exposing sort of the underbelly of what had been going on in the country for a long time. Um, the Hillman story is a whole other story, which I'm happy to get into, of course. But uh, hey again, what is the James Hillman story of my relationship with him is 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 connected to this of course and i'm happy to talk about that if that's what yeah, you want to we do. we will talk about that we're we're saving that for the second part of this conversation um when bobby gets himself in trouble rfk junior gets himself in trouble most recently with the uh, clip on the quote about um uh Asians and Ashkenazi, Chinese and Ashkenazi Jews being less susceptible to COVID and making the link to the Mayo Clinic study, which I looked at, which in fact says that they're less susceptible, but then linking that to the probability, in my view, possibility in others that it came out of the Wuhan lab. And I've studied that area fairly closely and the Wuhan lab, uh, as you've written, was a place where uh, Dr. Fauci was subcontracting for research he could no longer do in the United States. And uh, it was part of a network of labs in China, some of which are expressly dual purpose uh, places. And Bobby uh, makes the link to the possibility that these were designed as bioweapons. And of course, the roof fell in. Um, yep. But my question to you is that when Bobby says things like that, um, do you follow him? Are, are you in full integrity with him when he gets himself in those linguistic uh, difficulties? I actually am. I mean, there are times when I'm, I, I've talked to him about this too, that he could choose his words a little more carefully yeah. because he, people are out to, out to get him. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, he's, he's a candidate for president of the United States. 
Mm-hmm. There's a great fear, I think, among the, a lot of the Democratic establishment that uh, he's doing as well as he is because he's telling the truth as he sees it about a lot of different things, and it's not in line with uh, the Biden administration in many ways. So, you know, I mean, people are scared of, of that, and and uh, and they should be. Um, so, yeah, he, he, I think, would be the first to say that he makes some perhaps errors in judgment in, in the terms of the way he puts things sometimes. But uh, still, I mean, ethnic bioweapons are real. I mean, Naomi Wolf just did quite an amazing article a couple of days ago citing many, many studies of this that, that I mean, the, what's what's often not revealed is that Dr. Fauci's funding, a lot of it, as of the early 2000s, uh, was connected to the biodefense industry after 9-11. And, I'm, and this is not conspiratorial. I'm not saying that he, you know, he was he set out to create the the weapon that escaped from the if it was a weapon that, that came out of the Wuhan lab. But there is certainly clear evidence, which the real Anthony Fauci, Bobby's book pointed out, uh, that uh, and it becomes more more of this comes out all the time that there was a, a concerted effort made at the beginning of the pandemic to um, not only stifle contrary views, but to cover up the possibility that uh, that this virus had emerged from a, a, a connection between the NIH, National Institutes of Health, and the Wuhan lab in China, where the NIH was funding gain-of-function experiments. And it looked a lot like, and a lot of the scientists were saying this early in 2020, that that's where the virus came from. It wasn't animal origin in, in, a, in a wet market there. And there were all kinds of conversations about this and emails that have surfaced that show that this uh, effort to cover this up was going on. So, you know, um, I, I I don't always agree with everything Bobby says, uh, but I think he's he's on to something and, and willing to point things out that most people don't want to hear about because, you know, right. Dr. Fauci, Dr. Fauci's America's doctor, right? Well, first of all, you and I could spend two hours on this subject easily. I have spent a lot of time uh, looking at the question of whether the Wuhan lab was the source of um, mm-hmm. the virus or not. And I have always been inclined to think that there was a high probability, there was a good probability. Uh, and uh, uh, and this was a situation where China and the U.S. shared an interest in suppressing that possibility. Sure. It wasn't just China that didn't want it to come out. Because if historically it turns out that the Chinese were developing, you know, uh, bioweapons and that the United States was funding uh, research in that lab, now they will contest. The U.S. contests that they were funding uh, enhancement of function, gain of function research. But there's no question that they were funding research there. Absolutely. And so if it turns out uh, that uh, it escaped from that lab, uh, and the immensity of the global casualty that resulted from it, um, that will be a historical fact of great significance. And, I agree with that. And so it is contested. We may never know, mm-hmm. but they surely had shared interests in suppressing that story. Absolutely. And so yeah. right. Have you read uh, The Real Anthony Fauci? Oh, yeah, I've read it. And, and do you stand by the integrity of the entire book? Yes, I would say I do. I, I think that uh, Bobby Kennedy did a lot of research. Uh, one thing about him is he's he doesn't come out of left field. I mean, he really studies science, and he, yeah. he loves science. And when he was a kid, he wanted to be a veterinarian. He loved animals and, and uh, you know, studied, you know, vivisection, all these kinds of things. Um and and uh, so he explored. He knew Dr. Fauci. So did his family. So did Senator Ted Kennedy. And uh, but, but as he began to research the book, he discovered a lot of things that were very disturbing to him uh, about the origin of, of about things that were put in place by Dr. Fauci to to solve the AIDS epidemic, which um, actually ended up killing a lot of people, like AZT, the drug. Mm-hmm. Uh, there had been this foster care uh, experimental system where kids were being tested and, and uh, harmed by uh, AIDS drugs. Um, so he wrote about all these things. And um, 
the book, interestingly, you know, uh, nobody would touch it as far as a review. Uh, the mainstream uh, press wouldn't didn't want to, you know, consider that it could be true, uh, any of it. And yet the book became a huge bestseller. Uh, I'm fully aware. I see it in the uh, in the bookshelves and the uh, the tables of many friends. And I have to say, I have uh, friends with deep progressive values who are very smart, who absolutely um, deny the integrity and validity of um, of the book and of Kennedy's stuff. So I'm carrying their voices in my head. Uh, these are not people who are apologists for big pharma or anything else, right. but I'm just carrying uh, 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 my personality is that I, uh, uh, you know, I have what Kate's called negative capability or uh, the capacity to hold uh, different truths in my mind mm -hmm. as uh, as valid perspectives uh, and then the mystery as to which of those perspectives is yeah. ultimately true, if such a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, to go to Hillman for a minute, uh, these are all mythologies. That's <laughs> true. They are all mythologies. And in that sense, uh, you could say they are what Hillman called necessary fictions. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the purpose of, uh, of Hillman's work in many respects was to uh, find ways to live with uh, these different mythologies, either intrapsychic or extrapsychic, um, with uh, how shall we put it, with more um, w to be able to bear them, Hillman said, you know, yeah, not to uh, not to uh, homogenize them into some kind of pablum, but to be able to bear the fierceness of these different myths. And in this case, there are two different myths that we're discussing, different necessary fictions in a right. certain way. Yeah. Uh, since science is a god in our time, mm -hmm. uh, an Apollonian god for that matter. Uh, yep. uh, and here are two necessary fictions in profound contradiction. And yeah, how, it, it, how do we live with that? It's exactly. I, I think the only way to really live with it is in conversation but you know to to go back and forth on these things and and not censor somebody like bobby kennedy and others who have a contrary view yeah. i was shocked i was shocked actually that as i was researching uh the real rfk jr there were a number of people who just wouldn't talk to me uh, right who had had really great relationships with him and fought with him on environmental battles and 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 suddenly you know he was persona non grata and and they couldn't even talk about those things that they've been involved with so it was like wow you know i knew some of these people pretty well and, and from those fights right guy in nrdc particularly and and uh so i i but but the the uh the conversation is has become so oh man so divided I and mean, he i know that he decided to run for president because and this was not happening when I started writing this biography. I didn't write it as some kind of endorsement of his candidacy. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, he did tell me that he had decided to do this, and he didn't really want to do it. I mean, he he in the sense that he'd had lots of opportunities in the past. He could have been governor of New York or run for governor of New York or some senator. Or people, all these things have been offered to him when he wasn't uh, anathema to to progressives, as you say, and and uh, and so. He said he just didn't see anybody else who could was really talking about things and and debating them and said where well, the country is so divided because we can't communicate anymore uh, across lines which he'd been studying how to do for a long time so um, it was called his campaign slogan was heal the divide right and and he saw he he set out to do that and that's what he's why he's still doing it you know and. But you saw, I mean, yesterday was this big hearing in Washington where he, he testified. I mean, I don't know if you saw it, but it was an impassioned speech that he was short, that he, 10 minutes or so that he gave to, before Congress, uh, this committee. And and uh, and yet, they, you know, people were on the progressive side, right? We kept trying to interrupt him and and uh, or stop him from talking. And, oh, we have should we have a recess to censor this this testimony that was false and I mean, it was it was really pretty appalling to me. Uh, yeah, let's take a chapter 
in your uh, the real RFK Jr. Trials of a Truth Warrior uh, book, which discusses something I didn't know, and that is uh, Bobby's efforts to um, free Sirhan Sirhan uh, from uh, from prison on the grounds that he didn't actually uh, kill his uh, his father. Uh, could you tell us that story? Yeah, well, it's it's quite a story actually. He he went to visit Sirhan in prison in, I think it was 2018. He told me before he went that he was going to go do this. I was like kind of stunned. Um, and he he went to see Sirhan, had a three-hour meeting with him and and, and uh, found Sirhan to be, and he's been in prison for, you know, more than almost for 55 years, I guess, something like that. And, and found him to be a very compassionate person, actually, who uh, deeply regretted having been in, in the pantry that night and firing shots, but had no memory of it, for one, and never has had. We could get into that if we want to. I mean, there were efforts by the CIA and the military called MK Ultra at that time to control human behavior. Some people thought this this became public in the in the mid 1970s that this had happened and and to manipulate people through use of hypnosis and drugs and and I think that that is what happened to Sirhan that he was given a, a, a trigger word or phrase or something to go into the pantry and he was on one side of Senator Kennedy and sen- and fired shots that did hit people but none of those bullets hit the senator that um, he was shot from behind. Um, and there was a security guard, so-called, standing there that is most likely the perpetrator, whether he was trying to stop Sirhan or whether he was assigned by somebody to be in there to do that. We have no way of knowing. Um, but so Bobby Kennedy had come to the conclusion, or I think rightfully, that Sirhan did not fire the, the shot, fatal shots that, that killed his father. And um, and went through a lot visiting with him that day in the prison. Um, one other family member, Douglas, his brother, also came out um, in favor of releasing Sirhan, not on the grounds that he didn't kill him, but killed his kill their father, but on compassionate grounds. But this was a real bone of contention. That's not even the right phrase, but it was a very upsetting to a number of his siblings that he would come out, Bobby would come out for this. Um, and and he did at the time. Sirhan had been paroled. I mean, he was going to be released. Uh, the parole board had decided to do that at the time. Bobby visited him, and or right afterwards, and then Governor Newsom um, rescinded that at the request, primarily of some of the Kennedy family members. So yeah, I mean, he's he took this on as well as public health, as well as defending his his cousin Michael Skakel, who had been wrongly imprisoned years before for a murder he didn't commit. And I write about all these things in the, in the biography. Um, part of some really tough stuff that uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. has gone through in his life that I think made him the man he is today. Yes, uh, at the end of your chapter called Encountering Sirhan, um, uh, prosecutors declined to support or oppose Sirhan's release. Uh, uh, so it came to pass that following the support of two RFK sons, the California Parole Board voted on August 27, 2021, to free Sirhan after more than 53 years of imprisonment, concluding he was no longer a danger to society. Other members of the Kennedy f- family remained opposed and so on. And then ultimately, uh, after you wrote the book, uh, Newsom declined to, uh, to free him. Uh, Bobby received a now rare opportunity to publish an op-ed he wrote in the San Francisco Chronicle, the pain that we all feel from my father's death should not prevent us from the pursuit of truth. I firmly believe the idea that Sirhan murdered my dad is a fiction that is impeding justice. If Newsom overrules Sirhan's parole, he will become just one more California official who claims to love my father but persists in denying him justice. Oh, you actually right. On January 13th, Governor Newsom denied Sirhan parole. Uh, but there's um, another place in here. Um, you talk about the, I'm trying to find it, but you talk about the the expert on hypnotherapy who, te- who went to visit Sirhan, isn't that correct? 
Yes, that's right. There was an expert in hypnotherapy who went to see Sirhan in prison. Uh, and said days. that he had rarely seen anybody as hypnotizable as Sirhan. Yes. So one of the things that uh, Bobby is famous for uh, is his deep belief uh, that the CIA does a lot more harm than good, and that elements of the intelligence agencies have been involved in the death of both his uncle and his father. That's true. And it is. I I, I don't just believe it. I've investigated it. So uh, my first book was on the Kennedy assassination. It was another tome, 800 pages, The Man Who Knew Too Much. And then I proceeded to write a book about the assassination with Jesse Ventura and also sort of a follow-up called On the Trail of the JFK Assassins So in 2005. So I've studied that. I was the first journalist, actually, investigative journalist, out there interviewing dozens of people in the late 1970s and publishing at that time in the Village Voice, which still existed and would, would publish such things. Um, so I spent a lot of time looking into this, and eventually I did talk with Bobby if he wanted to know what I knew and had uncovered, and... Uh, he was very moved by a book called JFK and the Unspeakable by Jim Douglas, a theologian, actually, um, who had written a, a story of the Kennedy era and why certain forces uh, were out to, uh, to to kill him, actually, to get rid of him because of, of his his stances on, on uh, well, because he was after the mafia, for one, his brother was. Uh, JFK had, was forging alliances with, with Russia and Cuba after the missile crisis where we wouldn't be here today if they hadn't uh, stopped their generals from moving toward a nuclear holocaust in Cuba. And uh, so, you know, um, Bobby has studied this a great deal in recent years and come to the same conclusion that I had already come to uh, before that. So, uh, but it's, it, again, you're talking two myths in a sense. I mean, you know, the, except most Americans today believe that there was indeed a conspiracy to assassinate the president, and it didn't come from Cuba or Russia, even though it was made to look that way at the time through Lee Harvey Oswald. So, and again, it's so interesting because most Americans believe there was a conspiracy, but when you take the further step to say that the American intelligence agencies were involved, that in the collective psyche crosses the line from a conspiracy involving others. In, in other words, people pretty readily believe the mafia may have been, have been involved, that the Cubans may have been involved. But the idea that the American intelligence agencies were involved or the rogue elements in the intelligence agencies were involved, that not that the point at which one crosses a line yeah into disrespectability let's just put it that way yeah well i, I think it's because the other solutions are a lot easier to come to i mean right. oh yeah the mob, the mob does all right. these things and cuba was our enemy and but when you start talking about a domestic conspiracy basically a coup d'etat that right. changed the course of american history 60 years ago this year right that's a whole other thing because then we're looking at a whole series of events that led us to where we are right now in the country that you've got to question all kinds of things and 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 question our own denial, you know, because it's a heck of a lot more comfortable to uh, believe there was just one crazy guy shooting these people in the 60s than it is to, to realize that, as I have come to conclude, that all four of those great leaders who could have taken us on a whole different path were cut down by the same force anyway, not necessarily the same people. But there were forces that wanted to keep the status quo as it was and uh, lead us down the path of utter materialism where we are today that killed uh, JFK, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Robert Kennedy. And we've never been the same as a country. And I don't think we can ever be the same until the truth of that is exposed, looked at as much as we can after all this time when most everybody involved in it is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting about having this conversation, both of us steeped in Hillman's work, is to see what you're describing as a mythology, 
uh, along with uh, the mainstream mythology that, yes, we guess there was a conspiracy, but it was the Cubans and the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and that when we we have a conversation where all four of those get tied together, JFK, yeah. RFK, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King, then uh, from the mainstream point of view, we veered even further into conspiracy conversation. And yeah. when we link all of that to big pharma and vaccines and so on, we create a I would say not a conspiracy, but um, a a framework in which, as you put it, forces that do not wish uh, our vision of the future well uh, have conspired to um, decapitate yep. uh, the leaders. Yeah, and that's a uh, let us just say that's a very serious charge. It is a serious charge. Yeah. People should also realize that the very term conspiracy theory em emanated from the CIA in 1967 when they were talking about how do we squelch this Jim Garrison investigation that suddenly surfaced and is saying there might have been more to it than just Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, they didn't want to talk about the fact that Alan Dulles, who had been fired by Kennedy as the head of the CIA, uh, had been uh, put in charge basically of the Warren Commission that investigated the assassination and kept any reference to CIA out of the picture. Uh, the House, people forget that the House Assassinations Committee in the, mid, in the 1970s concluded there was a conspiracy, a second gunman, because the, it didn't otherwise add up uh, with, the, with just the, where the bullets came from and so on. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, we, there's a lot of questioning and, and in-depth questioning that would need to happen and does need to happen in, in our country about these things and not just dismiss uh, the because it's uncomfortable and, and live with the, the so-called comfort that we have. You know, I mean, we're at, we're at a dire, very difficult time, a real transition time in this country. We're also, I think, in a, in a it's not entirely dark. I think there's there's some amazing people out there who are who are like Orland Bishop, who you know, and I know also, like Maladoma Same, the the great shaman from West Africa that introduced me to Orland some time ago, um, that you know, there, there's there is a there's some amazing futures <laughs> that uh, are awaiting us if we can uh, be truthful, begin to really honestly communicate with each other, have open debates. That's what RFK Jr. is calling for, and I don't think that's uh, such an outlandish thing. Do you? <laughs> No, I don't think it's outlandish at all. And I want to bring this segment of the conversation toward a close uh, because uh, we have a lot to talk about, about James Hillman. Uh, and I really could spend our entire time exploring uh, these issues. And so what I try to do is to... Uh, have this negative capability that Keats talked about, which is to hold the story that you are telling as uh, a compelling story that many, many Americans believe in, in one shape or other. Um, uh, I know, you know, Bob Moses, for example, who is a friend and colleague and uh, who uh, was one of the great leaders of the civil rights movement. Did you know Bob Moses or know about him? I did. I, I wrote about him in my book, Black Genius, actually. Yeah. Uh, so Bob Moses left the country because he thought after King's assassination and, the, and Malcolm X that he, that he was in line. And that's why he left the country and went to Africa with his wife uh, and only came back uh, when he thought it was safe and then received a MacArthur Fellowship. That's when I knew him through the MacArthur Fellows Program and uh, uh, died not long ago. But, but I would say that Bob and his wife, Janet Moses, people of the highest ethical integrity, are quite sympathetic to the line of thinking that you're describing. So there's just this whole part of the country that, really resonates with the vision that you're describing. 
And then there's this whole other part that is willing to say, yeah, there may have been a conspiracy on Kennedy. We don't know too much, the mafia and the Cubans, so on. And and hmm, I hadn't thought about an RFK conspiracy, but I guess maybe there's something there. Um, but they don't want to tie those pieces together into a coherent effort to decapitate uh, a uh, a better vision of the American future. And so that's where the mythologies collide. Yeah. And I think what both of us are saying is um, the only way to do this is through dialogue. And that dialogue has been um, itself decapitated yeah. uh, by the unwillingness. I mean, this is this is a high risk conversation. Now you're accustomed to these high risk <laughs> conversations because that's your work. And I spend a lot of time with the people who sort of countenance the idea of some conspiracies involved, but aren't willing to put it into that uh, framework. Yeah, well, it's really uncomfortable. You know, I mean, I'm I'm like you. I'm a, a liberal or pro progressive Democrat. You know, and I yeah. have been. For, for years I'm not but I've I've actually found lately that some of the I've been doing a lot of podcasts and radio interviews on RFK Jr especially since my book came out a couple months ago or a month ago I guess and uh you know I find a lot of these so-called right-wing commentators to actually be quite open and interested and and uh, independent thinking about these things and in a way that surprised me and and you know I, I I don't know. I mean, we really I think of the reason a lot of people, independents and so-called right wing people, I guess, uh, and some uh, not the extremists, but are, are really open to what RFK Jr. is doing is because they just haven't been told the truth by most of our politicians. And so they don't trust the government anymore and they want to or at least RFK Jr. says we should be able to because we certainly did in the era when his father and his uncle were around. He calls himself a Kennedy Democrat in that sense, you know, which we've come when you start, you know, censoring people and, and don't want to hear any points of view other than your own. I mean, that's not the Democratic Party that that I grew up with. And uh, so I'm very disappointed and sometimes really outraged about that, uh, you know, and, and the fact that these hit pieces can continue to just kind of mirror each other now uh, uh, as if. What, you know, the, Bobby Kennedy is just this crazy guy who, who suddenly is talking about all these things that we should just dismiss out of hand. And that's that's just not the case. So I'm pissed off at The New York Times and the Boston Globe and all these papers I've been reading for years about this. And and I think it's wrong. And I guess, you know, I, I, I'm thinking my own work and I'm in my mid 70s now. Um, I began thinking about it in a different way, knowing that I was going to have this conversation with you, that that I guess what it's always been about is kind of bringing what's hidden to the surface, uh, starting you know, with environmental issues I was involved in, but then in many dozens of articles that I, that I wrote about things that were you know, hidden from the public. And then the Kennedy assassination, which I'd researched prior and wrote a book about in 92. Then the genius of African-Americans, which I wrote this book in the... In, in the late 90s called Black Genius and the American Experience, it started as a counterpoint to, um, supposed to be anyway, to the bell curve, this horrible book that came out, you know, pointing out saying that there were racial differences in intelligence between uh, blacks and, and whites. But um, I, I, en I ended up doing this whole other, other thing with it because I was led down this path where I interviewed these amazing people and discovered the the connections both to their own ancestors as well as to their their families and how how learning was passed from Winton, to Winton Marsalis, for example, from Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison and Romary Bearden and uh, about Ellington and Armstrong and you know just this amazing uh, you know collection of people that I I had a chance to 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 profile and chapters called ancestors and then today so it, this was all kind of a precursor. Of, of my work, I think, with around James Hillman, who I hadn't yet met when I when I wrote that book, or I just met, I guess, when the book came out. Um, you know, to anyway, it just goes on because I, the gray whale situation. That it was a natural history book about the this the salt works that was going to jeopardize this mysteriously friendly animal. 
that, you know, what is that all about? Why are whales suddenly coming up to us? Are they trying to teach us something? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, and all these things kind of overlap with Hillman, I guess, you know, I mean, his, in, his interest in animals and Kennedy's interest in animals for that matter, my own. I don't know. There's just this kind of confluence of interests, I think, that I kept finding as I explored these, these different subjects. And we can talk about this in the Hillman part too, but also some of it had to do with my own son and what I went through um, with uh, and what James Hillman helped me with in terms of our our relationship because um, he had been diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was 17. And uh, you no, know, I do want to follow up on your son. I ordered uh, your uh, book on him and sadly it didn't come yet. It should come probably tomorrow or so. But could you tell us a little about your son, that journey and that book? Yeah, I eventually wrote a book called uh, My Mysterious Son, A Life-Changing Passage Between Schizophrenia and Shamanism, because I wanted to not expose, you know, all the difficulties that I'd gone through as a parent, which were many, um, after that diagnosis, um, but also to show people that there were alternatives or at least adjuncts to medication, because I had seen the effects of of just constant, you know, doctor after doctor prescribing more and more meds for 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 my son that were really debilitating to him. Um, and you know, I'm not saying this was some kind of conspiracy. It's just what was presented, you know, by Western medicine. And and so it was through uh, James Hillman that I became aware of a man named Melodoma Somme, who was a shaman from West Africa. Who James had gotten to know during his time with the mythopoetic men's movement, as it was called, where he spent like 10 years, um, and I'd love to talk about that too, about what the men's movement was all about, with Robert Bly and Michael Mead um, having these incredible sessions, week-long gatherings with, with men in, in the woods of Mendocino and, and Maine and Minnesota. Um, and in the course of that, they had a, a gathering at Buffalo Gap, West Virginia, where 50 black men and 50 white men came together for a week in the same rural setting to just talk about life. And wow, was that incredible. And Maladoma spoke there for the first time about his own passage from having grown up in Burkina Faso, being taken from his parents to be educated by the Jesuits when he was about four or five years old, um, escaping from that world when he was 21, returning to his village in in Burkina Faso, where he spoke no, did not speak the language anymore, going through the initiation there and becoming someone, his name itself means he who becomes friends with the stranger. He went on to be educated at the Sorbonne and at Boston University and write books and, and uh, became a, a, a remark, spoke for the first time at this gathering and just knocked the room you know, the room went crazy. Um, and I got to know him then. Um, I interviewed him over the phone about James Hillman. But then when I was going through this period of trying to find something for my son that was different than just the Western approach, um, my wife suggested that, it, why don't you check in, try, try to get a hold of Melodoma again? So I did. And um, I went to see him for a divination. Uh, which is uh, an interesting, you know, sort of. I'm, sort of I'm very familiar with divination. So. Yeah, ceremonial We're on familiar ground. Yeah, yeah. So it was a ceremonial day or evening when uh, you know I moved these bones and stones and objects on a on a on, on this cloth and and then I was told to stop by him and he read the pattern of all of these objects to tell me what he saw and one of the things he saw was that. My son, who is biracial, uh, but his ancestors on my the ancestors on my side couldn't understand him, did not know who he was. Um, they had to somehow I had to somehow begin to reach out to them. It led me on a on a quest really to get to know my ancestry in a way that I hadn't. Uh, I'd never been interested in, frankly. And um, anyway, it's a long story. That I ended up chronicling in the book of how uh, uh, eventually um, my former wife and I, uh, she's African American and we're still very good friends, uh, took Franklin to Burkina Faso to spend a month with Maladoma and 
and uh, a group of people uh, going through a healing series of healing rituals. It made a huge difference. Uh, part of that was, I think, that we were doing it together, you know, as a as a as a family unit, and we're all going through this amazing situation where we're using this these this uh, ancestral this pot, you know, of herbal ingredients to bathe in, to drink from, going through ritual sacrifice of animals for us. Um, anyway, it was it was a life-changing experience in a lot of ways. And my son came out of it, uh, Franklin came out of it, um, he was able to go off his medication almost entirely. Um, eventually, unfortunately, the doctor took him off all of it, and then he had a crash, but that was seven years, plus six or seven years ago now, and he's been doing great ever since. Um, still on some medication. I don't propose Western medication for this condition. But um, anyway, that's the story I tell to just show people in similar circumstances that there are other ways to to look at things. And um, prior to that, it had been James Hillman, who he was never my therapist. And I'll we'll talk about how I got to know him at all. But I remember one day I went to see him. I think it was in 2004, before I began writing a book about him. And uh, we were friends at that time, um, 21 years apart in age. Um, and he asked me, he said, there's something wrong. He said, is it, is it your son? And I said, yeah. I said, because I was told him how I would go places with, with Franklin and we'd go to a restaurant and he'd, he'd start, you know, making up some language that it wasn't English. And, and uh, he'd, he'd embarrass me, actually, you know, and I'd, I'd correct him, kept trying to do this. And James said, something that really transformed my life at that time, which was to quit trying to change him, you know, and, and correct his, his way of being. He said, just, you know, go there with him. Um, and try just listening to what he's saying and share your life with him more and, you know, tell him what you've been doing in a, uh, recently. And, and, and uh, even if he goes, you know, out there, doesn't want to hear it, just kind of go with the conversation. And once I started doing that, it was amazing, the change that it brought. This was before this experience in Africa or finding uh, this shaman, shaman melodoma that I'm telling you about. So it was hugely helpful. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I wrote about it in, in the book as well. Not that book, not the biography. So, yeah, that's the, the quick story. I mean, I also have had to confront um, my own ancestry in ways that... Um, I never imagined I would have to do. Could you um, say more about that? Yeah. Well, this was um, in uh, about about almost ten years ago now, and I was doing another divination with Maladoma where things were uh, things were off in this uh, with the with the pattern that, that something wasn't right. And he told me that uh, there was something he felt I had to do. He'd long said that I had to somehow bridge this gap between the ancestors on Franklin's mother's side and on my side, somehow. And I'd been working at that, the series of rituals that he gave me to do. And he said, but I, what I want you, what you need to do is you, you have to find a slave shackle from the slavery era. And you've got to take it. To the middle passage where Franklin's ancestors came across. And you got to return that shackle to the sea. And I went, what? How am I supposed to do that? I mean, I, I was like, I, that seems impossible to me. Well, I... I did find a slave shackle. You know how I found it was uh, I went on eBay <laughs> and, and it actually, there was a shackle from that era available and I bought it for $300. And I, when it came in a box to my home, I found that I, I couldn't open it. And I then went to, I didn't know where I was going to do this. I, I, I went to Cambridge, Maryland where, um, my ex-wife's ancestors had, had originally settled and, and was at the end that at the middle passage where many 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 slave ships had docked first i i took the shackle to um 
in still in its box. I went to Frederick Douglass's home and also to uh, where I was not welcomed. It was now owned by you know a bunch of people in in Maryland that didn't want any part of me. And when I, I got to the, the place where Frederick Douglass, who I'd written about in Black Genius, had um, had fished when he was a boy, I finally opened the box. And I put the shackle on the car seat next to me and drove on to Cambridge, Maryland. I went to the Harriet Tubman Museum and this, watched a film about the great Harriet Tubman, and uh, I'm sure people are familiar with. And then I walked over to the wall, there was one plaque on the wall, and it was a reward being offered by a slaveholder for an escaped family of, quote, mulatto uh, people who were part of his, his slave his system. And it was signed by William Russell. Now, I had never found that name among my ancestors, and you can imagine it, it did me quite a turn. I spent that night in Cambridge, Maryland, and uh, the next morning got up, um, called my wife at home, found that after I got off the phone with her, uh, my watch had stopped, and it wouldn't start again. And I was somehow in a different time zone. And I was holding the shackle in my hands and weeping. It was an incredible moment. I left that morning and I, as I walked out of the hotel room, I dis well, I discovered the night before that there was a ship going out the next morning, a replica of an 1812 uh, ship from the War of 1812 and was taking tourists out on Chesapeake Bay. So I booked a passage on it. And as I left the hotel room to go to the, go to the, uh, to the bay, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates was on TV talking about reparations for slavery. So there were all these synchronous, mysterious events happening to me as I approached this moment. I got on this boat, and there were like 30 people on it, and I had the shackle and my black bag over my shoulder, and I didn't know how I was going to do this. Finally, I found a, a moment where there wasn't anybody watching me, I guess, or just around. And I, I walked to the bow of the ship and I brought the shackle out and I threw it into the water and I said, take it, water spirit. And something changed. Something lifted. That I knew had to do with this ancestral divination that I'd been, quest that I'd been on. And it was uh, after that that I ended up going to Burkina Faso with uh, with Etta and Franklin. Um, you have mentioned, and you mention in uh, um, in the end note to the third volume that you were kind enough to send me. You speak. Uh, you've spoken several times of your extended family. That's the phrase you use, and you mention that Hillman said to you that he was fascinated by how you all live together. So this, uh, this, feel free to answer this or not answer this, but I'm curious, is this an extended family in the conventional sense of that word, or do you have an extended family that is one of the many alternative ways of exploring living together that takes place uh, all over this country? Yes, it's, it, it's the latter. Mm -hmm. And I've been living with a group of friends who have become family for many, many years now. And initially, uh, we had uh, we discovered Hillman's work in the 1990s. We've got homes in different parts of the country where we've shared a life for a long time. And now into old age, a whole bunch of us still living together. And uh, uh, so we've been reading the Souls Code and other of Hillman's works. And... Uh, then we, um, one day I was, I was at our place in Boston and, and in the kitchen and we were talking about James Hillman and suddenly a young man piped up who lived, lived with us been raised in the family. And he said, oh, my, my dad, his dad had left the family and he was an organic farmer in Connecticut. And 
said, uh, my dad knows James Hillman. He sells him his organic vegetables in, in the market in Connecticut. I said, wow. So I called my old friend and I said, Wayne, we've been reading James Hillman and wonder if maybe you could, uh, could, you, int- could you introduce us to him? Or you introduce me to him sometime. I'd love to meet him. And Wayne said, well, he's, he's a very private man, you know, and I don't know. But So anyway, that was the beginning. Where I, I set up a lunch with, with Wayne and, and James Hillman came and it was just, and he and my wife was there. And uh, we found that <laughs> we didn't talk about psychology. I mean, I'm not a psychologist and and we talked about, uh, um, you know, having been in Africa when we were young and what it was like traveling there. And we talked about boxing because we both, I, I knew Muhammad Ali. I'd written about him. Uh, James loved Muhammad Ali. We just, you know, we had these kind of common interests that had nothing to do with with, with uh, what he did for a living or what I did for a living, actually. So that was the beginning. And then he came to visit my, uh, my extended family in in our homes and visited us in Mexico where we had a place and in Boston and Los Angeles and, and community had always been a huge part of James's life and work. I mean, he, he loved uh, to work in, in collaboration with people. He often wrote about uh, community and he loved the fact that, you know, we, we were certainly didn't have a utopian life, but that, you know, we were, we were sharing a life together and we had a, a construction company that, uh, you know, helped support us. And, and, and we were really working at this and had for a long time and had been through lots of ups and downs. And, and uh, the, the meaning of spirit and soul was very important to us and music was vital to us. And, and uh, so he was very interested in this and he and, and his wife, Margot at that point came to, came to visit us and, and the, I never had any thoughts that I would be his biographer. Uh, and then something happened, which was at the end of 2004, I guess it was. Uh, I was up visiting him over the holidays at his home in Connecticut, and his, his older sister was there, Sue. And she uh, she was telling stories, you know, just about their the growing up years in Atlantic City and uh, what life was like. And she was a great storyteller. I mentioned to him after I said, you know, you should, while she's alive, you really should, because he was older than he, you should really start getting some of her stories on tape. It would be a great thing to do to just to preserve. And so they gave him the idea to bring all of his siblings. So there were three siblings and um, and and uh, his kids, as many as could come. He had four kids uh, to come together. They were all adults, of course. And Lawrence Hillman was one of them, astrologer. And and, uh, and they would they would talk about you know, they would share stories, and and I, I James wanted to f- have it filmed. So there was a young woman who'd grown up in, in my family who was a filmmaker, and she came and and took footage of that weekend. And and I, being the investigative reporter, you know, it was kind of natural. I asked some some of the questions of these things, this thing, and and then our our wives, uh, Alice and and Margot, started hanging out, talking, and glass of wine, and. I, it may have been Alice who said, well, is James ever going to do a biography? And, and Margo said, well, he's never wanted to do that. He has eschewed that, actually. People, people have offered it a number of times. But it, and it, it led to a conversation. And then James asking me, you know, if I was interested. And I, I said, yeah, <laughs> of course I, I am. And this began a remarkable thing, which was, this was 2000 and. Four, I began working on it, I guess. Um, in the beginning, 2005, I guess it was, it was some wonder, you know, James, uh, Alice and I traveled with James and Margot to Ireland where he'd gone to school at Dublin, at Trinity College in Dublin. And I went to, with, with him to Zurich where he had been at the Young Institute for years and began the research that turned into an almost 20 year project. And he told me right from the front, he said, this will take years, you know. And he wanted me to work on other things, which I did. I wrote other books while I was pursuing this one. And uh, suddenly there I was, you know, this was the first biography. RFK Jr. is my second, although I did a bunch of mini biographies, I guess you'd say, in Black Genius. Um, and it was, he said, welcome, traveler. And it was, uh, he knew that this was going to put me through a lot as I, researched his life and looked into archetypal psychology and the various gods that inhabit us and the things that he had written about. And, you know, I, I 
didn't really feel qualified in a lot of ways, but he didn't want a psychologist to write the book. And if there was going to be a book, he wanted, so I guess, somebody like me, you know, as an investigative journalist, uh, eclectic interests, um, sort of a similar coming out at things from a, an underground perspective, in a sense, um, and knowing, being able to appreciate that and being able to just talk to all kinds of people and be interested in all kinds of people, which I am. And um, so that's that's really how it came about. And it was not always easy. Um, as I say, he gave me great insight into my son's difficulties and uh, and other things. Uh, we went through a period after a while where he, you know, he questioned maybe was this, was I doing the right thing, you know, because I kept wanting to interview more and more people. And uh, I didn't, I was afraid really, I think, of really diving so deep into his work that I, you know, to explain it in a way that I was, you know, I, that I really understood it. I'm still coming to terms with understanding a lot of it today. You know, I've gone back through the book to talk to you and it's still alive in that way. There's so many branch to this that, I mean, for me, this is one of the most important conversations I've done in uh, 20 years or whatever it is of doing new school conversations. And so it, it's so rich for me. I also am grateful that I hope we're going to be able to do one about the third volume, which is, by the way, when is the third volume coming out? It should be coming out hopefully in September. They're, they're both. Well, then completed. we'll have... I hope more opportunity then, but because I'm still interested in the biography of the biographer, and you've been kind enough to speak of your extended family and the homes that you have in different places, including Mexico and the construction company, I, I have two questions to ask you. One is, are you in some sense the head of this extended family? No. <laughs> no. Very no, interesting. Not, not at all. We're we share a life together, but uh, and we don't have regular meetings in terms of, uh, uh, you know, we've got to figure things. I mean, we've been living together for a long time, so we know each other very well. Now we're getting old together. Um, leadership is important, but it's it's not something that, uh, you know, I'm not the I'm definitely not the head of the family, so to speak. Okay, what is? Can you describe in some way the myth of this extended family? How do you? hold yourselves? What is the story that you tell yourselves about how this came to be and why you have done it together? Well, it, it came out of the, the 60s and the folk right. music era and really um, the world of, and really music, you know, has been of vital importance mm -hmm. for many, many years. And uh, there was a series of tapes that were, that were made by the management kind of People gravitated toward in the beginning, started the family. It's been, been gone for a long time now, but we stayed together. And, and uh, you know, the music of, of not just the 60s, or, or not just folk music, but the roots of, you know, popular music in the United States and and uh, and, and, and finding the value in that, and which actually, you know, my parents grew up with, not, not so much me. Um, but I think if there's a, it's very much, about the growth of the soul, I guess, and an appreciation for spirit when it's there. Um, and the fact that as much as James Hillman has written about that, um, you don't, you don't find the meaning of what soul is by yourself, that, you know, it, it's, it's a reflection that, that you, one develops a group soul really in some ways, but also an individual soul from your relationships and through what you've been through in life. I mean, it is not easy to live together with a whole bunch of people. No, it's not. Live together with a few people. So we've, we've, we've been through some really tough times, you know, that, uh, um, and I guess that's, I would say, well, certainly a reason that I could appreciate James Hillman's work, uh, why I can appreciate, I guess, where RFK Jr. is coming from. I mean, he's been through a lot of tough times too. And also, you know, grew up in a, an extended family mm -hmm. with cousins and, you know, all of that. So then there are these kind of interesting parallels in those ways. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, he was 
Bobby Kennedy's been on the bottom. You know, he, he was an addict for a long time when he was young, 14 years. He came out of it and somebody who still, you know, works very hard in AA to, uh, to help other people. He's, he's never left that program. I, I have quite a few friends who have lived in the kind of extended family that you're talking about uh, for a decade, sometimes several decades. But it's rare that these extended families stay together unless there's some kind of glue. There's something that makes it worth it to go through, you know, as Nietzsche says, those who have a why to live can bear most anyhow, right? <laughs> and yeah. um, so I get that music is central to it, but let me just ask you this. Is is the mythos of the Hillman work central to the family? Or is there any other, okay, music, sure. But what can you say anything more? And then I'll stop asking you about what the, what the core mythos is that has enabled this group soul to form and continue through all the hardship? What is the at the heart or the soul of what has kept you together? Well, well, that's a big question. I guess I would say it's ultimately the value of relationships. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, the number of us have stuck together. Uh, we have, we we live monogamously, mm -hmm. but and especially as we've gotten older. Mm -hmm. But you know, we also in, in many cases live with our exes. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if people have remained part of the same family, you know, mm -hmm. we've 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 we have a very intimate relations with uh, mm -hmm. with with each other in that sense, and we've been through a lot together and and built a life that uh, I think. It's not for everybody, but it's it's uh, for me. It's it's most of the books that I've written. I feel most of my work uh, has emanated from how I live. I don't think I would have you know ever gone to San Ignacio Lagoon and discovered these whales, or uh, you know I don't think that uh, I would never have met Jesse Ventura. I would probably I've never met James Hillman, uh, if not for the web of relationships that I was already part of and with these common interests. Mm. And the fact that, you know, we, we learned how to uh, build a life, literally and figuratively, you know, with a, a construction company that evolved out of learning how to fix up our own houses. I was never very good with my hands, but my friends are, were, and, uh, and now we're getting old and facing challenges together that, uh, you know, are not all, are not the same, um, but still at the core, I think is, is the, the fact that we're not growing old alone, you know, that we we have each other. We're, some people are passing away now that are very dear to us and that we've known for, you know, God, 50 years, really. Um, so that's a whole nother thing. And it's it's uh, it's painful. It's it's. Um, and yet, you know, we're still in it together. I don't know if this if you can really get that without <laughs> do, you, do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the lovely line from Ramdas, uh, who says all we're really doing is walking each other home. Mm, yeah. 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 Uh, let me just go back to Maladoma Somme uh, for a moment. Um, uh, he is, of course, uh, uh, known to and uh, uh, connected to our mutual beloved colleague, Orland Bishop. And Orlan Bishop, as you know well, is this very extraordinary uh, spiritual teacher, whatever language you want to wrap around that. Uh, your wife, Alice, uh, helped him edit his book, you were kind enough to tell me. And I've done, as you know, uh, a now five or six part biography like this one with Orlan. Uh, and Orlan, of course, you, you talked about taking the slave uh, shackle that Maladoma Somme told you to find and give it back to the ocean uh, and to the Middle Passage. And of course, in Orland's work, the Middle Passage is a central myth, an absolutely, absolutely central myth on the transformation of uh, African consciousness that came 
with the death experience of the uh, Middle Passage and what it gave African Americans uh, as a a, a life affirming spiritual contribution to American life uh, and the role of Martin Luther King and all this is are parts of what um, Orland uh, talks about and 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 we've had extraordinary conversations one of them quite recent about his childhood and his early experiences with uh, spirits um, just as one example he says when he was a child he had very few friends but the school bus would pass by a graveyard and the number of spirits in the graveyard would almost overwhelm him with this. so Orland lives in that shamanic world yes. which Maladoma Somme lives in and Maladoma Somme gave you a series of rituals to do and your son was profoundly helped and your whole relationship with him was helped first by Hillman listen to your son uh, and then by Maladoma Somme so my question to you is and I know you're, you have a, a lovely, I would say, kind of inner modesty in the midst of your life. Um, have those shamanic experiences, which have meant so much in your life, led to any kind of initiation, or if not initiation, identification with the shamanic? element or mythology in you in other words are you quietly um not only living a life deeply informed by hillman's work but are you living a life that is imbued with the shamanic experience uh to a degree that it is a guiding principle i would say yes uh in the sense that well, it's 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 a lot of it's an invisible realm, right? I mean, connecting with ancestors, uh, but I've Maladoma, unfortunately, tragically, one well, of not tragically because it was well, it was unexpected, but he died uh, about a year and a half ago mm -hmm. in the midst of these workshops that he was doing uh, in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. But I was going to work on another book, a book with him about, mm -hmm. and uh, I went to the first two. The second one was on ancestralization. And uh, I've never written about this yet, but I there I confronted, um, this is following on the shackle story I told you, but I confronted a slaveholder ancestor in a cabin at a ritual that Maladoma did. And it was tremendously profound for me, and I found myself shaking and crying and in front of all these people at the, at the shrine that was set up in front of us. And, and uh, but also it was a very um, necessary and perhaps cathartic thing, maybe not just for me, you know, not just for me, but for the ancestral realm as well, which I have come to believe in through my relationships with James, with Belladoma, with Orland. And I also found that, and this is a too long a story, I'm not going to go into all of it, but I found that it put me on a path uh where I was led in ways that I would never have expected. I, I met Orland through Maladoma. And uh we became friends and colleagues in a sense. Um and then I was at a workshop that Mel that Orland did in uh 20 early 2015. I was going through a very tough time in my life personally. And uh I met a fellow at the end of that who invited me to come to a meeting of, that they have once a month called ECHO at an organization called the Youth Mentoring Connection, where they brought inner city kids together from uh, all walks, you know, from, from South Central LA, Hispanic kids and black kids, uh, to just let down their hair about their lives. He said they were having one of these meetings the next night. So I went. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if I'd ever go back and I met this kid there um, named Romeo and it turned out that well uh, in, in the in the course of the night the man running it uh, the evening 
use Homer's Odyssey as a way of teaching kids about life, talking about how the word mentor comes from the Odyssey and the word sirens comes from the Odyssey and these kind of interesting things. He came to a point in the story and he said, can anybody in the room tells me what, tell me what happens next? And this kid sitting across from me started telling the whole rest of the Odyssey. And I went, wow, that's an interesting kid. He revealed that when he was, he was always in trouble, that he uh, was grown, grew up on the streets, basically, <clears throat> and was in juvenile detention uh, when he was forced to read the dictionary and discovered he not only really loved to read, but he loved the myths. And he said, and I know all the myths. And he did. And we became, I, I became a mentor to him. Uh, there's a long, long story. Um, took him to the Getty Villa in Los Angeles, where we had people following us around the museum like he was the tour guide. Because every single thing we saw of these Greek and Roman sculptures, he knew the story behind it. We're now doing a book together about our relationship, which is still going on um, eight years later. And uh, he spoke in the Pacifica, actually. He spoke on a panel, a storytelling panel there a few years ago about his life and what it was like going to jail unjustly over a weekend and what he went through in that period. He also did a book, uh, not a book, he did a, an article for a mythological journal uh, about how myth changed his life, saved his life, really. And he came into my life at a time where I really needed to know more mythology. I felt it was a weakness in me that, that uh, James Hillman's mythology and all this, I just didn't know that much. So in a sense, this kid, 17 years old at that time, was teaching me. Now, is this shamanic? <laughs> I'd say it's it's part of a path that, you know, I had no idea where it was going to go next. But suddenly this young man from South Central who grew up robbing people on the streets is in my life. And I'm in his. And what's that like? You know, this old guy from West Hollywood, the Hollywood Hills, right? And we went through a lot of stuff. And uh, James was no longer around to know, to hear about that story. But uh, Orland certainly has been and has been very involved in, in uh, helping me through some of this as I got to know these kids. Yes, well, we both, I think what has really connected us at the deepest level of trust has been that we both know and trust Orland. And so. that, that's been important to me and important to you. And uh, so thank you for answering that. So uh, first of all, we're going to get to continue this conversation when we talk about the third volume. But in the last piece of, of this conversation, let's really turn to Hillman and to uh, this incredible biography. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a constant reader. Uh, so reading is sort of at the core of my life. And, you know, having taught at Yale in the early 70s and being a kind of uh, deinstitutionalized public intellectual, the quality of your biography of Hillman is just astonishing. And there are so many places that we could start here, but uh, Pat Berry is somebody I've done a new school conversation with. I've been in touch with about our conversation today. Uh, I will do another conversation with Pat. But when I think of your, your book, in each book, you have the, the kind of the romantic lead or the romantic interest. Uh, and so in the first book, uh, it was, um, uh, well, there are several potential candidates, but it is the woman that he went to India with and so okay. forth. Yeah. And married. Yes. And then well, in yeah. the second book, it's Pat. And then you end the second book. Uh, you've referenced her several times, but you end the second book. Uh, let me just find the phrase uh, with uh, his third wife. And, uh, and in a very dramatic way, um, you... Uh, you say to be continued. So in each book, there's kind of a a, a romantic lead. It's Margot, uh, his third wife, and uh, and and you end the book uh, with Margot and the fact that they collaborated on the book Dream Animals, um, and the quote 
the very last quote is, uh, uh, what Hillman came across in Margot's metaphorical forest, she was a painter, was unlike anything he'd encountered before, especially one small painting. He went to an exhibit of hers that his eye had to search out to identify a minuscule cheetah nestled in among the trees and rocks of the installation, her art exhibit. Years later, the two of them would collaborate on a book called Dream Animals. I have that book. A friend gave it to me. And he would reflect on that moment, quote, it was the tenuous reality of the animal, that it was there and not there, much like the animals in our dreams that can be so terrifying, so startling, and yet are, quote, only dreams, end quote. She, Margot, seemed to have caught in a painting something that I had been working on, teaching about, trying to put into words for 30 years. And then you write, to be continued. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I notice about, I mean, you're, you describe Hillman uh, as uh, many people saying that Hillman is the greatest writer uh, in the history of depth psychology, which is quite something to say since Freud got a, a Nobel Prize, right, for, for fiction or yeah. for literature. Uh, and so Freud was no mean writer himself. Jung is no mean writer himself. Yeah. But Hillman made language itself part of his psychology. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, going back to Pat, in my mind, I think of volume two as Pat's book. Mm. And uh, volume three is Margot's book. And I just wonder, do you carry any of that in your conception of what these books, how they're framed? Well, it turned out that way because, you know, originally I didn't intend to write three volumes. I was going to write right. one. Right. And then it just got too big. Yeah. <laughs> As often my books do, right there. Right. And uh, I write these tomes. So, you know, and it seemed like it'd been a natural segue or progression from you know his his first wife and and the first volume ending actually uh, in the midst of his his uh this affair that he'd had in Zurich where they where he got kicked out as director of studies at the Jung Institute and uh but was still with with his wife Kate and and at the, he actually had met Pat Barry at that time because she was a student at the Jung Institute in Zurich and but I didn't really write about Pat in volume 1 at all so yeah, she comes in right away in volume two. And uh, Pat, of course, is, as you know, an extraordinary person and very, uh, I just love Pat. And we we had some incredible conversations together and, and I interviewed her more than once, several times. And she played such an important role. They were working colleagues as well as lovers and eventually, you know, man and wife. Um, but uh, she played such a huge role in, in the beginnings of archetypal psychology and carrying it on through the years, and a role that perhaps, you know, has not been as appreciated as it should be, because it was, it was remarkable how they worked together, and, and really how archetypal psychology, as it's called, was born in, in, at the Warburg Institute one day, you know, at a, at a, at a dinner between Pat uh, and, and uh, before they were really together publicly, and Rafael Lopez Pedraza, and uh, and James and, uh, and how they 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 realized in that moment that they were doing something brand new and it had much to do with with uh, that we are not monotheistic in the sense of we're we're it's not just one God but we're composed of many and they were studying at the Warburg these amazing images you know, from the Renaissance and Ficino and going back to the Greeks and, and the Romans and and realizing that the archetypes. Uh, were still very much alive today, and and that uh, they were brought more alive even in these series of of events called Springhouse that that uh, James and Raphael and Pat hosted in, in Zurich for these kid not kids really but young adults who had come to Zurich uh, come to the institute searching for something searching for Jung really uh, you know in the era of everybody was traveling around and there were hippies and and uh, and then. A lot of them enrolled at the Young Institute, and a lot of them later became very well-known uh, depth psychologists, Hillmanian psychologists, whatever you want to call them, in their own sense. You know, Paul Kugler and Tom Kapasinskis and David Miller and Ed Casey, all these people who were there. 
for those formative years of, of archetypal psychology at Springhouse, where they dove into, they would have these incredible nights, everybody was drinking and and, and invoking really uh, the, these these gods and these esoteric texts like the Picatrix and and uh, the memory theater of Don Camillo. And so I write about all this in the biography because it was so fascinating what they were you know, bringing to life and light with these young people uh, who had never heard of these things. Uh, and there was one point I remember Raphael, there's a story about Raphael who was, he was a wild man and he was, uh, uh, he was from, uh, from Latin America. He and James were very, very close for, for many years. And uh, he would always, he was like a bull, you know, he would invoke these, he, he, would, he would grunt. He would, he was like this incredible figure that uh, one time there was a, they were having one of these spring house nights and, and, uh, and talking about Dionysus and suddenly a drunk fell through the window and Raphael threw up his hand and he said, you see, we constellated. <laughs> they brought Dionysus right into the room, right? So there were these, you know, these amazing moments. And uh, so Pat was a part of all that and, and not just that, but then later in, in Dallas where, where uh, again, you know, totally, I mean, 25 years James Hillman spent in Zurich, right? Which I chronicle at great length. And he came to deliver the Terry lectures at Yale and really, started becoming very well known, wrote Revisioning Psychology, which was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, and that's the, the subtitle for, for this second volume. Um, and um, and then suddenly he goes to Dallas, and he spends six years there at the University of Dallas at first, a Catholic school, very unusual place for him to settle and be, with this remarkable collection of thinkers, you know, Louise Cowan, the brilliant English professor and Robert Sardello and Gail Thomas, Joanne Stroud, um, and they dove into archetypal psychology. And and uh, uh, then Hellman gets fired eventually from there, and then so do these other people because they're too controversial. He's too radical. And uh, he, then they start the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture, where, you know, with, with Pat right there for all of this too, they, they get into how do you how do you envision a city? What's the soul of the city? What's that all about? And they bring in, you know, all these great thinkers about, they bring in Ivan Illich and they bring in, you know, the, uh, Jane, what was her name? Anyway, the woman who's... Jane who's, Jacob. Jane Jacob, right. No. All these people to, to give these remarkable talks on the soul of the city. And James Hillman is writing about ceilings and and uh, the meaning of walking and and, you know, these things that you never would have expected that he would dive into. But he did. And then later, he, you know, he, they moved to Connecticut after six years. And, and there he's living a rural life with Pat in the last years of their marriage, riding horses, getting stuck in quicksand, uh, where his life is also in somewhat of quicksand at that time. And then he gets, he gets into the men's groups with Bly and Mead and, and you know, in the, in the woods with all these strangers. And he's the egghead, right? He's the intellectual. But um, he, and he has to. He has to embody himself. You know, James Hillman has, he's a double Aries, right? Astrologically. But he has no earth in his chart. Uh, nor do I, actually. What are you? I'm a, I, I'm a Leo with five planets in Leo. In, and, in Leo? Yeah. A Leo with five planets in Leo. Yeah. So wow. that's a lot of Leo. <laughs> that's a lot of Leo. <laughs> it's a strong <laughs> will, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, um, so, uh, but we, anyway, I don't have any earth either, except my midheaven and my, uh, my uh, uh, rising. Hillman, not only does he get fired in Dallas, but of course he got fired from the Young Institute as program director. Yep. Why? He gets fired for having an affair with one of his uh, patients, which most of the other faculty are also doing. Yeah. And the guy who leads the charge against him has had an affair with Hillman's wife. That's right. Well, right. That, and so not know about. And the cynicism yeah. of that, the, the cynicism process. of that mm -hmm. is really staggering. But had he not gotten fired because he was, as you say, in the first volume, he was the best student ever to go through the Young Institute. He puts on a theatrical performance kind of mocking the Institute, and he hears Jung in the back of the room laughing uproariously about it, yep. while other people are offended. 
Uh, and then he gets fired because he is introducing new ideas and new concepts. He gets fired. But had he not gotten fired, he would not probably have invented archetypal psychology. He would not have gone to the Warburg Institute in London, which had this great collection of Renaissance images and found Marsilio Ficino and his key role as the Plato of the Renaissance and, you know, his archetypal uh, uh, astrology. And so there, so he keeps, and then he gets, yeah, and then he, he gets fired in Dallas, but meanwhile, he has transformed city planning in Dallas. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then he, he joins, you know, uh, he joins Robert Bly and Michael Mead, Bly and Michael Mead and has the seminal role in the initiation of the men's movement, you know? Yeah. So there are these series of throwing himself into these new contexts and <laughs> suffering greatly along the way. Yeah. And constantly coming back to what is it there's this beautiful line that you capture um that why he wanted to add adler to uh, freud and jung as a key figure right right and it is adler isn't it yes yeah and he said that adler was the first one to have a postmodern consciousness mm -hmm. and he said that what Adler understood was that Freud and Jung were both asking what the soul wants. And he said what is Adler understood is most important is that the soul does want. <laughs> yes, right. And I thought that was a very powerful line. Yeah. But from Adler, he developed this sense that what psychology is really about is competing necessary fictions and coming to an understanding that our purpose is not to solve our problems, but to be able to bear the power of the uh, mythic forces within us and bring them into a relationship that deepens us. Is that fair? It is, you know, that th th it's the symptom itself that, you know, drives you, drives right. you into the, right. the depth of your soul. And of course, I think it, with the situations that you just described with James's life, and I found it in my own, you know, when I've been down, <laughs> forced yeah. to the bottom, those are soul making experiences. Yes, they are. And, and new paths open up that, you know, we always have choice whether we're going to follow that path or not. But there's a I, I firmly believe there's a thread to life. Certainly, I've found it in my own a uh, thread of destiny. That if I'm willing to to go there, follow it, uh, it's going to open up uh, remarkable new ways for me to communicate to the world um, and to to in my relationships with others. So it's it, it's and, and he. I mean, I think both those things you described. He would never have. He would never have got there, you know. He, he there would be no archetypal psychology if he hadn't been booted out of that situation he was in. Because we all get comfortable too where we are. We want to we don't want to lose our our jobs. I mean, he went through hell over that. Um, but you know, he went through it, and then he was going through a very tough period in the eighties when he when he discovered that he went into the men's group world, which was completely again, you know, you see this all the time, misinterpreted and judged by the big media and, you know, made fun of, oh, it's just a bunch of guys out in the woods, you know, getting off on dancing and together and putting their wives down and whatever it was. It was so not that. And I have two long chapters in the book that elucidate what that was really about. God, I mean, I wish we had it. I actually attended later a Mendocino event that was incredible. But uh, what those guys did, those three teachers and Maladoma bringing Maladoma into it, um, eventually, and and using ritual and mask making and animal clans and and dividing up and and, and having these incredibly deep conversations uh, where they would return, you know, to their wives and the wives would go, "Wow, something happened," <laughs> and it was good, you know, that these these my husband is different than he was, <laughs> and you know, sometimes it was a one day affair, sometimes it was six days, and. 
And uh, but there were these, you know, these guys out in the woods and Hillman going through a lot with that, you know, because uh, I think I, I, I tell the story from the very beginning, first time he went, you know, he didn't know what to expect. And and he was kind of viewed as this effete kind of weird guy by, by some of these. There, there were some tough people there, you know, had been Vietnam vets, and ex-cons and, you know, not just that, but among the crowd. And and uh, this at the very beginning of, of when Hillman was was giving a talk, uh, they had this they they created this event where this guy walked in completely naked and sat down. And uh, all, all Hillman did was look, suddenly look out over the room and say, would you stand up, please? <laughs> I mean, wonderful, right? And, and, and these kinds of things endeared him, you know, to that. He, he, he didn't know what to, the only thing he did was he didn't know what you wore at these kind of things. So he, they were out in the woods of Mendocino and, and he, wove, he wove together this cap um, out of out of, you know, little branches and and, and ferns and all these things. And he, he walked into this group of men. Uh, and, and he said, my name is Fern. <laughs> so, I mean, he was willing to even make a fool of himself, you know. And later, of course, he did a lot of, they, I mean, he, he got into tap dancing and he did things like there was one night. I want to tell this quick story, too. They, they were, uh, there was a, somebody at the end of the evening, oh, men were, the men were just kind of dancing they don't. They didn't drink at these things, but they, they got into revelry sometimes and drumming. Drumming was a huge part of these events, as well as all the deep talk. And and somebody had brought a sex doll into the room. You know, when, I don't know what it looked like exactly, but and they were, you know, it was it was offensive. I mean, it was. And you know what James Hillman did was he walked over, he picked up that doll, and he danced his way out of the room. Yeah, I mean, another level. Yeah. On another level, I want to. Uh, we're getting close to the close here. I could go on for a long time, but we agreed to two hours. Um, but I want to ask you this question because it's my central struggle with uh, Hillman, and I find Hillman astonishingly important to me psychologically, spiritually, in terms of my understanding of of depth psychology. But I also differ with him. Uh, I think part of his difference with Jung was not only, uh, you know, his theoretical differences, although when the Red Book came out later, he felt that Jung was much closer to him than he had understood previously. But um, also, you, you know, Jung was sort of deeply Christ-centered. Uh, so he uh, Jung... Uh, was spirit-centered and Christ-centered. And, uh, and Hillman, as a, uh, as a deeply Jewish uh, background uh, and who had encountered existentialism as a fundamental uh, experience early, um, was, was neither spirit-centered nor Christ-centered. And so for his own sake, it seems to me, he had to reinvent psychology, and he became aware that that's what he was doing. He was reinventing psychology, adept psychology. But my quarrel with him, and I want you to correct me if you think I'm wrong, is that while he wanted to get away from Apollonian, upward-moving spirit and to speak for soul, the feminine that stays close to the body and to feeling, I think he moved too far from spirit. And so in my own understanding, and I want you to correct me if you think I have this wrong, I have a, a non-dual cosmology in which soul and spirit are equally balanced dimensions of what it means to be human. And so... Um, I'm curious as to whether you think my reading of Hillman that in focusing so deeply on soul and speaking for soul, he said that when spirit ascends, soul gets lonely. And I'm curious whether, I'm not asking you if you share my point of view, but whether it's a valid point of view to say, you know what, Hillman is amazing 
but uh, I I have this equipoise between soul and spirit. You spoke of Hillman as welcoming spirit when it shows up, you know, the puer and so on, but staying focused in soul. And I try to have an equipoise. And I'm curious whether that strikes you as a fair perspective. Well, I think it's, it, he was out to change therapy as well. And he felt that Jung's emphasis on the self and the emphasis in therapy generally on, uh, oh, it's it's the fault of, you know, how you grew up with your father and your mother saying right, this right. to you, et cetera, was not where the answers were. And of course, eventually he developed what's called anima mundi, soul in the world. Yeah. He felt people yeah. needed to really pay more attention to what was going on around them, notice these things and change you know, save our, our our ecology and et cetera. So he he was he he said, to, but to get there, he was making a point that you know you you drive down. You, it's all about you know going to the depths in order to find out what is your soul asking you to to do and be and and and. Uh, so I, th- I think later in his life, and it's true what you say. I mean, he would certainly respond to what we can call spirit. You know, to coming in to move him in a, in a certain direction at a certain time. And I feel that way too. But but um, he came, when the Red Book happened, he realized that these invisible figures, these 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 uh, remarkable communications that, that Jung was having with, with the dead, and which Hillman had come to feel also were very, very crucial to life, to the, the connection to other worlds. I mean, he... he learned more about that, I think, and came to believe that uh, he and Jung weren't really so far apart at all. So we'll get to that with the volume three, I think, because it's a, as he writes the soul's code and writes these, these actually much more, um, well, in a sense, less dense books in certain ways. Um, but some, some people find his psychology really, really difficult. Um, that's because he constructs language in such a way that he doesn't do traditional paragraphs, and you know he, he's he's a he's a very unusual double Aries thinker in that way. I don't know if I've answered your question, but you do. And uh, we committed to two hours, and we're coming right to the close. But uh, let me ask you before we do a close: Is there anything that you'd like to add to this conversation? I mean, I found this conversation immensely rich, and I'm immensely grateful for it. Uh, and I decided that rather than following a structure, that I just wanted to let soul and spirit move between us. And it's felt immensely alive. So I thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add in closing to this conversation? Well, you know, I felt that way, too. I've really appreciated this this conversation. And, and it's a real conversation. It's not like we formulated something and we're which sometimes I, I prefer. I mean, you know, I, I, I want to stick to this. And I mean, I went back through my whole book and looked at it and, you know, thought, oh, I got to get these things across. And yeah. but then it leads in a different direction. But it's all part of the same kind of wonderful mix. And I guess I would just say that I just feel so blessed, so lucky, really, to have lived the way I've lived, to have been exposed to the people I've met, everything, everyone from Muhammad Ali to James Hillman to, I mean, you know, to Bobby Kennedy and and explore the darkness of things that have happened in this country, as well as the beauty of it and through people like Maladoma and Orland. And so I'm just, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm an, in that sense, I guess I like to think I'm an instrument for relaying certain things and that I came in with that. I was born with uh, that soul's code and I've done my best to fulfill that. And, and uh, I really, uh, I'm still at it. <laughs> and so are you. So it's really great to talk with you today. Well, Dick Russell, thank you so much for being back with me at the new school at Commonweal. Thank you for this extraordinary second volume, uh, The Life and Ideas of James Hillman. Thank you also for describing to me uh, uh, your deep connection with uh, uh, RFK Jr. and your new book, The Real RFK Jr. Trials of a Truth Warrior. And because um, the third volume will be out in September, I'm hoping to absorb that and be talking again soon so that we don't lose these threads. And uh, we will have uh, a complete set of uh, 
uh, explorations of three volumes and of the biographer himself. Well, I'd love to do it. And uh, yeah, and the third volume is very different. It's more thematic in a way. It's not as chronological in certain senses. So we can we can explore a lot of different things. And, and uh, I love doing that. And so do you. So I'll look forward to it. Thank you. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't. Don't take it, 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 don't, don't, don't. The river is a healer. The river is a 